Hello, I'm Nancy Shepherdson. I am the Senior Educational Technologist at Wilson Language Training. Thanks so much to the New Jersey branch of LDA for asking me to speak at your, this year's event. So it was a pleasure to work with uh, LDA in general, and I love working with their state chapters. So thanks so much for including me. At Wilson, this is our mission. I'm not gonna read you the slide, but the bottom line is, is we want teachers to have the tools that they need to teach the kids that are sitting in front of them. Here is our title, uh, Assistive Technologies to Facilitate Reading and Writing. This is how you reach me. I am on Twitter. Um, Wilson is on Twitter, or you can email me with any follow-up questions. I will say that the handout is an essential part of this presentation, and that is linked for you um, where you clicked on this session. So, I highly encourage you to have that handout ready and open so that you can click the live links as, um, as when I talk about different tools, you only obviously click the links that apply to you and the tools that you need to learn how to use and the tools that your kids are learning how to use. Here's our disclaimer. We have absolutely no connection financial or otherwise to any of the tools that I'm gonna show you today. And this is our agreement. You don't need to record because we've recorded for you. So please don't record. And then here's our agenda. We're going to talk about text to speech, speech to text, and word prediction. And we're going to talk about the research around each of those topics. And then I'm going to show you some tools on how to activate those, um, those, uh, these tools for your students. Now, keep in mind that there are a lot of you and only one of me, and so it doesn't make sense for me to show you every possible tool. So it's this is a little bit like a combination of a hybrid course where I'm going to show you some things and then I'm going to count on you to do some self-directed learning and click on the links that I provided in the handout so that you can learn about the different tools that you need to learn about to for your own practice or for the kids that you work with. Okay, so let's start with text-to-speech. So let's define it. Text-to-speech is when the text is highlighted and the text is then read out loud for the user. Now there's lots of research around text-to-speech in comparison to speech-to-text and word prediction because it's been around the longest. It actually came around in the 80s um, and the research started to come out kind of mid 90s. And in general, the research is very promising, especially for our comprehension skills, that when we lighten the cognitive load for our students who struggle to read, if they use all of the gas in the tank, if you will, or all of their cognitive calories to just decode the words, then when they get to the end of the sentence or the end of the passage, they're out of gas. They've spent all their cognitive calories just pulling the words off the page. And so what's left, not much for comprehension. And so in general, the research shows the biggest benefit for comprehension skills because they're not using all of their cognitive calories. They're not using every bit of stamina that they have to pull the words off the page. The text-to-speech does that for them. And so there is cog there are cognitive calories left to think about, well, what is it that I just heard? What do I know about that? Can I connect it to other things that I know? Can I infer based on what I heard? All of those great comprehension skills. So I will give you a couple of examples. There's work from Gandhi that came out in 2017. And that work showed that read aloud accommodations benefit struggling readers when the question stems and the answer options as well as the full text are read using text to speech. Gandhi's work was especially impactful for the very low decoders and the very, very low decoders. They benefited the most from the full read aloud options of um, text to speech. The less challenged readers only needed the read aloud of the question stems and the answer options. And the study found that the higher decoders didn't find the full read aloud option was necessary. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you're a stronger reader, you're not going to need the text to speech as much. And then there's work from Gruder, Ostberg, and Hedonis. That's also a 2017 study. They showed the text-to-speech improved reading rate as well as comprehension. And that work showed a higher impact on comprehension with younger children 
not as much with older children, but they all benefited from the increased reading rate, which is very interesting. It also showed that younger children with ADHD had less of a benefit, yet the older kids with ADHD showed more of a benefit. So that's interesting. And then the higher the silent reading comprehension scores were, the less text-to-speech had a benefit. So faster readers decreased their reading rate when they use text-to-speech. So strong comprehenders shows, they show less of a benefit. Again, that makes sense, doesn't it? Um, and then students with reading disabilities definitely feel less fatigue. They have increased independence. They find it easier to finish their assignments on time when they use text-to-speech. And that comes from the work of Bone and Bauk. That's a 2016 study. Bone and Bauk's work also showed that there was less distractibility for their students with ADHD when they use text-to-speech. So there is a, there is a combination of um, results out there for our students that do have ADHD. So it's really important for you as the practitioner to really be discerning and to determine whether this is going to be a benefit for your student or not. Um, there is a link to a blog that came out from Bookshare that talks about the difference between text-to-speech when it is a human-read voice versus a computerized voice that is linked in your handout. If you want to check that out, that always comes up. And really, it does come down to uh, student preference. Some kids do not mind the computerized voice, and some kids really do mind it. So again, that's where you have to be very discerning with your particular student and customize it for him or her uh, when they're using text-to-speech. Things to consider when you're going to use text-to-speech with your students. First thing is, and this comes from the work of Sarah Wood from the Florida Center for Reading Research. She did this um, with her advisor, Rick Wagner, and their colleagues in 2018. And they did a deep dive into all the research they could find around text-to-speech. And then they um, identified the studies that were kind of the gold standard. And then they did a meta-analysis of those studies. And so these are the results from that particular article. So one of the things that they found is that you want to make sure that you have the ability to adjust the rate, meaning the speed in which something is uh, read. You also wanna make sure that you can change the voice because especially if you're using computerized voices, that can have the Charlie Brown effect, that same that wah, 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 wah at the front of the room. So you wanna be able to change that up because that can get very, very monotonous for students and, and very easy for them to lose focus. You wanna make sure you can tag the document which means to, so you don't lose your place. So you get, you know, three quarters of the way through an article, you wanna be able to tag the document so you know exactly where to go when you are done. You wanna have the ability to highlight. And when I say that, I don't mean that the words should be highlighted as they're being read out loud. What I mean by that is that they can go back and highlight a word that maybe they don't understand, or they can highlight a passage that they wanna talk about with the teacher later, or they may wanna highlight um, a sentence they wanna pull out to um, incorporate into some written piece. That's what I mean by highlighting. Um, and so you also wanna make sure that whatever you're using for text-to-speech, that you have great access to tech support so that you have the ability to troubleshoot with no problem. And interestingly enough, you know, as a testing accommodation, Buzzick and Stone, it's a 2014 study, they used it with a control group and a treatment group and lo and behold, all of the kids in the study benefited, regardless of a disability, from the use of text-to-speech. So I think that's a very interesting finding. Now, like I said, there are rules for the road when it, you when you come to text-to-speech. It's not something you can just wake up on a Monday morning and say, now we're going to use text-to-speech. You have to give your students ample time to practice. You can't just throw it at them and expect them to master it. Um, and you especially do not want them to learn how to use it when they have a looming deadline. You want to make sure there is nothing at stake so they can feel free to use the tool, practice it, make mistakes, and not feel like they're under the gun to get something in to a teacher by a certain time. Model, model, model. Please show them how you use it. Let other people that have used it longer show them how they are, he or she are using it. So just, you know, keep in mind that, in, at least in my experience, the more kids see other people using it, 
the more they are apt to use it themselves. Like I said, make sure you can change the voice and the rate is needed to avoid that Charlie Brown effect. And then teach kids to be metacognitive when they're using text-to-speech. Ask them to think about what's your purpose? Why are you using this right now? Is it because it's really tough content? And if so, you want to make sure that you coach them to change the rate so that if it's a really dense, content-heavy passage with lots of new concepts, you want them to bump the rate down. So that gives them time to absorb whatever it is that they're hearing. And you also want to make sure that the opposite is true. If it's something they've read before, they've got the content, they just want to hear it one more time. Let's say they're studying for a quiz, then bump up the rate, make it go faster if you just want to hear it one more time. And then I've also had really good luck identifying certain voices that go with the genre that they're reading. So they have a voice for their math textbook. They have a voice for their science textbook. They have a voice for whatever trade book they might be reading for their literature course. I've had great luck using that with kids. Um, they hear the voice and they identify it with the content area and it kind of opens up that bucket, if you will, in their brain of the content, let's say it's science, they get in that headspace, oh, that's right, we're reading about you know, metamorphosis in science. Okay, I know what I know about that. Now I'm ready to listen to whatever this passage might say. So I've had good luck with that. And remember, we always want to have the actual book present whenever possible. I really don't want kids sitting back, putting their hands behind their head and just listening. That's passive. I want them with the book in front of them, highlighting if that's what they need to do, physically highlighting, because we know the research is clear that the more our students have the actual hard copy in front of them with the text-to-speech benefit, that is a that is best practice when we're thinking about using text-to-speech with kids. Sometimes it's not an option, and I get that, but whenever it is possible, have them have the actual hard copy with them. Now in your handout is a link on how we can turn text-to-speech on on a cell phone. It's a link um, from understood.org and it's wonderful and it gives you the basics on how you turn this on your cell phone depending on what kind of cell phone you have. So here's an example of where you're gonna do some self-directed learning. If you're not sure how to do that on your device or on a device that one of your students might have, click this link and it will walk you through it. Now let's look at how we turn on text-to-speech in OneNote. So if you're a Microsoft school or a 365 school, um, it is built into OneNote. So as you can see on the screen, there is this little arrow that has a line in the upper left-hand corner there. That is how you access your quick access toolbar. And that is how you customize that quick access toolbar. So once you click on that little arrow, it's going to give you a pop-up pop menu that says more commands. And if you choose the commands from that list, you can select all commands. And then you'll scroll down to the speak command, select that, and then click add. After you do that, you have to click OK. And again, this is linked in your handout. So if that went too fast, you can go back and click the link. So you can speak. Um, you can use the speak option to read the text out loud. And then after you've added the speak command to your quick access toolbar, you can hear single words or blocks of text read aloud by selecting the text that you want to hear and then clicking the speak icon, which is now embedded into your quick access toolbar. So you can see on my screen here, I've circled it in blue. I That is what it looks like once you've added this option to OneNote. So now all you would have to do is just highlight whatever it is you want read out loud. You go up, click that icon, and off, you're off and running for text to speech in uh, OneNote, which is through Microsoft. If you happen to have Read and Write, which a lot of schools do, um, Read and Write is a software toolbar that helps students create and access content with the literacy support features needed to create a personalized learning experience. It helps every member of your class meet their full potential. It is a great, robust tool. I love the text to speech in Read and Write, but I just love Read and Write in general. Read and Write is owned by Text Help, 
They have recently merged with Don Johnston. So whether this program will change a little bit as a result of that, that remains to be seen um, because Don Johnston has uh, another tool that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens to those two wonderful programs, whether they end up merging into one or not. But um, the text-to-speech embedded into read and write is really, really well done. And as you can see from the screen, it offers lots of other things as well in addition to the text-to-speech. This is a great tool for all subjects across the curriculum. It offers, it offers support with everyday tasks like reading out loud, reading the text out loud, understanding unfamiliar words, researching assignments, proofreading your written work. Um, it's great. So, and they do offer a free trial for teachers. So when you can, always try before you buy. Now, if you have a Mac, there is a video in your handout on how to do this. So don't panic if this goes too fast. But if you have a Mac, you're going to click on that Apple in the upper left hand corner and you will see that there is that those two words, system preferences. And once you click on that, you're going to see a little blue guy in a blue bubble, little accessible accessibility guy. Go ahead and click that. And then you're going to get a screen that looks like this and you're going to click on speech. When you do that, you're going to get a box that looks like this. And this is where you're going to customize it for your students. So there are lots of voices to choose from. In this particular screenshot, the voice that I chose was Alex. But do keep in mind that there are lots of voices built into the operating system of a Mac. And some of them are utterly ridiculous. <laughs> and so you need to give kids time to get the giggles out with these voices on a Mac. Because they, I mean, some of them are, they sound like they're underwater. Some of them sound like a, a pipe organ. Some of them sound like a monster or a scary ghost in a haunted house. I mean, they're just utterly silly. So let the kids get the giggles out with those <laughs> with no looming deadline. Let them get that out of their system. So, and then let them decide what voice they want. And again, they want, they may want different voices for different genres. Underneath that, you'll see speaking rate. That's where they can go in and customize I want to bump up the rate. I want to slow down the rate, depending on what they are reading. Now, to set this, you'll see at the bottom, change key. And I have mine set up to be control T. And I learned that the hard way because I did shift T, which is also how you make a capital T. And that played havoc in, on my particular computer. So I have will tell you from personal experience that control T doesn't do anything else other than just turn my text to speech on and turn my text to speech off. Um, but you can choose or your student can choose whatever they want the commands to be to turn it on and turn it off. And you can customize it for every student. You can change this all the time. So that's how you set it up. It's really quite easy. Now on a PC, it is not quite as straightforward because as we know, right, there are so many different vendors of PCs. So unfortunately, this is not universal. So this is how it looks on my particular PC. But again, you might have to click on some of the links in your handout to find how it will look on your particular PC. But what's interesting to note is that on a PC, they don't call it text to speech. They call, you have to go to speech recognition, which of course, <laughs> That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, which is why I pointed out to you. So click on speech recognition. And once you do that, then you get this slide or this screenshot on your PC. And you'll see on the upper left hand side, there's text to speech hidden kind of in the corner under this screen that says configure your speech recognition experience. So not intuitive at all. Um, hopefully they will get better at this and make it more intuitive, but you want to click the blue words there that say text to speech. And then once you do that, you'll get a screen that looks a lot like what you see on the Mac, where you can choose the voice, you can choose the rate, you can preview it, choose what you want. But remember at the bottom right hand corner is the word apply and you have to click apply or it doesn't stick. So keep that in mind when you are setting that up for your students. Now, if you are using a Chromebook, text-to-speech is best uh, activated using an extension. So you wanna go to your Google Chrome browser and click on the apps icon, which is in the upper left-hand corner. That brings you to the web store, which can be in different locations on your screen. It depends on your computer. And then once you're in the web store, just in the search box, 
click on, or type in, I should say, text-to-speech, and then click on extensions. Once you do that, you're gonna get a screen that looks similar to this. And these are just top three options that came up when I did that. Now, what's interesting about this particular um, slide is that look at the numbers of people that have reviewed these. So the top one has had over 3,000 people review it. The middle one has had over 1,000 and the bottom one only 55. So you want to show that to kids. You want to point that out to kids because a three-star rating from over 3,000 people, at least in my opinion, is a more robust endorsement than a three-star rating from 55 people. So you want kids to be, again, metacognitive and critical thinkers when they think about which text-to-speech option they want to try first. You know, all of these are free. So try one. They like it. Great. They don't go to the next one. So that is the best option if you have a Chromebook is to add it as an extension um, and it will become part of your toolbar. So this is what it will look like. Once you've added the one that you like, now you have your toolbar at the top of your Chromebook and there it is, the little megaphone is the icon for text-to-speech. So that's what you would do. You would highlight whatever it is on the screen and then you would go up and click on that icon and then you're off and running with text-to-speech within your Chromebook. If you have Microsoft Word, there is text-to-speech built into Microsoft Word. So you need to click on the review option, which is underlined here in blue on your screen. And once you click on the review tab, it brings you to a screen that looks like this. And you'll see right there, there's the read aloud. You will click that. And when you do that, you'll see this little box that you see at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And that is where you can adjust your reading speed and pick your voice. And you'll see the little arrows there. Those are the, you can use those arrows to turn it on to fast forward or rewind. So that's how you do it within Microsoft Word. What's nice about that is it does not require an internet connection. So sometimes that is an option, or I should say that is an obstacle for some of our students who might not have um, the internet connection connectivity at home. So this is a nice option that doesn't require an internet connection. Now, if you're in Google Docs, regardless of what kind of computer you use, you are going to look in within an open Google Doc, you'll see the word add-ons. When you click on add-ons, you can add a text-to-speech reader. So it's called Reader, and you'll see at the bottom, it says Get Add-ons. So that's where I, that's what I did. I went to Get Add-ons, I put in Reader, and then, it, and then I added it to my list of add-ons. And so, and then you'll see underneath that manage add on so you can manage it. So if you find one that you don't like, you can take it off there. But once you add it, you'll see right there, reader is there. You click on reader and then you'll see it, op you'll see open reader. And once you open your reader, you get a pane on your screen that looks like this. For me, it ends up on the right side of my screen, but every computer will be different. But here's your, here is your toolbar where you can change the voice. You can change the pitch. You can change the rate. And I like the option, that bottom one, where it can reread it for you. So once you've highlighted something, you can use that back, <coughs> excuse me, that back arrow, and it will read it again. That's a nice option. The only thing I don't, I'm not crazy about this particular option within Google Docs is the red guy. You have to click the red guy to start it and to stop it. Red to me is not the intuitive color, but that's, that's how you turn it on and how you turn it off. Now there are outside options for text-to-speech. These are my favorite. I love Bookshare. I love Learning Ally and Project Gutenberg. Um, Bookshare is free for students that have documented disabilities. They, you could get an organizational account for your student school and or an individual account. I encourage you to merge uh, your child's individual account with your organization's account. That will offer your student the most flexibility in using Bookshare. Uh, Bookshare is aligned with the NIMAC. So if you have a student with an active IEP, books by law, courtesy of IDEA, are stored on the NIMAC. And with that active IEP, you can get uh, accessible digital copies of your student's textbooks that will be downloadable to your Bookshare account. So that's a really nice option. 
But the downside for some people in regard to Bookshare is the computerized voices. Um, in my private practice, I exclusively use Bookshare. I love it. My students love it. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool, but you do have to have a documented disability, whether that's a print disability, a vision impairment, a, dys a student with dyslexia. Um, in when I was still in schools, I actually used it um, for students that were recovering from concussions because they just could not be looking um, at the book. They just had to hear it um, while they were recovering. You know, so that was a short-term license for them until they were recovered. So it's a great tool, um, again, funded through the Office of Special Ed, completely free for kids with documented needs. Um, there's Project Gutenberg, which has a library of over 60,000 free eBooks. It works with EPUB and Kindle eBooks. You download them or you read them online. It is really known best for for works of fiction that have no longer um, are where their copyright has expired. So you kind of, you know, the Macbeths and the um, the older works that where the copyright has expired, you'll find those on Project Gutenberg. And then um, Learning Ally is not free, uh, but if you have a student with a documented disability, you can get Learning Ally written into that student's IEP. So the district pays for that. What's wonderful about Learning Ally is it's all human read voices. And for some kids, that's a game changer. So um, keep in mind that if the if um, Bookshare has um, the computerized voices doesn't really fit for your kid, ask about Learning Ally. Um, and I will go back to just to remind, um, remind you or, to, or to, to tell you that Bookshare also has an app that will allow you to use it on your phone or your tablet. And it's called read to go and it's the numeral two. So it's word, the word is read, the number two, and then the word go, but it's all one word. So that, that is also an option for a tablet or a phone. Um, and then there are these two tools called Libby and Sora. So Sora is the little Martian flying through the sky and Libby is the little girl there reading her book. Sora is a free app from the company called Overdrive and Sora um, aligns with your public school or your private school library. So any digital books that they have in their collection, you can download those digital books using the Sora app. Libby aligns with your public town or city library. So if you are really want to be careful about what titles kids listen to, you want to go with Sora because generally school libraries will not have titles that you do not want your kid listening to, where Libby, that isn't the case, right? They have all sorts of titles. So both are free, <coughs> excuse me, and they're wonderful. I, I think I honestly have read over 100 books in the last six months using the Libby app. I just love it. And they are the original, beautiful quality, um, music, sound effects, different voices. They're just fabulous. Now, they don't come with the text, right? So you've got to have the hard copy. Then there are some handheld options. This is the seat pen on the left, the orange one. And then there is the scan marker, which comes in a variety of different models. This is really a uh, personal choice. They are both wonderful tools. It really just matters what your student needs. There are links in your handout for videos and different information on each of these. But the way these work is they are, you just scan over the text and it reads it to the student out loud and it comes with an earbud. So, you know, the whole room doesn't need to hear what they're, what they're listening to. Um, the CPAN has an exam version, which is actually the one that you see on your screen. So it has no connection to the internet. So there's no way a student can use it to cheat, but it also has an option where it is connected to the internet and it has built-in dictionaries and translation tools and note-taking options. Very powerful tool. I love the CPEN and I love the folks um, at the CPEN company. They've done a wonderful job based out of London. And uh, you know, I highly recommend that you it, try it before you buy it if you can. Um, and then same with the scan marker, different price points. They've all they they are like I said, I love I really like both of these tools, but they both have their own pluses and minuses. So that's why I really encourage you to try them before you buy them. And then there is this app called Seeing AI. This is a Microsoft app. Um, 
It is iOS only for the moment, but it looks like there is an Android option in the works. Um, and what this does is provide fabulous text-to-speech using the app on your phone. It also provides a lot of other great things, um, which goes beyond the, the, the topic of what we're talking about now. But seeing AI is free and offers very robust text-to-speech. Uh, all you have to do is just use it like a camera, you know, and put it over a sign or put it over a piece of written work, and it will read it right out loud to you. Now, here are some resources that were put together by Jamie Martin, who is from the New England Assistive Technology Institute in Hartford, Connecticut. He graciously allowed me to share these with you. So all you need to do is scan these QR codes and it brings you to more information about text-to-speech and all different kinds of ways. It's a really well done resource. And thank you, Jamie, for sharing that, with, allow, allowing me to share that with all of you. Now let's go into speech-to-text. So the big difference, right? Text to speech is where the computer is reading the text to you. Speech to text is when the user is speaking and the device is typing for the, for the user. So there is uh, absolutely research around it. This is my favorite study, this Shadiev, Huang, Cheng, and Huang 2014 study. Um, and they found that speech to text is enabling students to better understand content of academic activities, to confirm missed parts of speech, to take notes, to complete homework, and to prepare for exams. That comes from page 75 of the study. And specifically students with cognitive or physical disabilities, it served as an effective tool to write and record their speech. And in some cases, the application of speech to text has enhanced the student's basic reading, spelling, and writing skills. That comes from page 71 in the study. Now, keep in mind that speech to text should never be used in isolation. It is one tool in the toolbox. Really, many tools should not be used in isolation. We use them in combination with other tools in the toolbox. So, when someone starts speaking and the computer starts typing, it populates a blank page, which in the students that I work with, there is there are very few things that are less daunting or more daunting than a blank page. So it populates the page, it gets the ball rolling. Is there revision and editing and wordsmithing that needs to happen? Absolutely but at least it gets the ball rolling. So that's what I love about speech to text. But keep in mind that speech to text can have a low recognition rate of homophones. So your theirs and your twos, they may not, the speech to text may not pick up on the right one that you want. So you wanna make sure you really uh, coach the kids to edit for that. Um, although it is getting better every, every day, the technology is improving. Um, it ha also has found that if you are having more than one speaker, then speech to text can get a little confused between two different voices. So it is better to use it for just one user at a time. But keep in mind, like speech, like text to speech, speech to text has to have training and you've got to give them at least a solid week of practicing it again with no looming deadline before you use it for any kind of what, you know, a real assignment. Now there's a link to this video in your handout. So I'm gonna play this video. In order to turn on dictation, speech to text, go to the black apple in your system preferences. Then you're going to go down to this keyboard. and select dictation. And then turn it on. And then you can decide what shortcut you want to make dictation start. So I have press the function key twice. So then now that it's on, go to my document. I'm going to press the FN key twice. And now, I can start dictating and it will type for me. And that's how you set up dictation. You click done.
Okay, so that's how you do it on a Mac if you want to activate your speech to text. And speech to text on a PC is, um, again, not, not always as intuitive as you, as you might like. So you want to search in your control panel with the word speech. And when you do that, you'll see a screen that looks like this. And you'll see down at the bottom, dictate text and control your device, use, controlling your device using only your voice. And you want to toggle that on. And then that will turn on your speech recognition. There are two links in your handout. It's a Loom, one is a Loom video that I made for you to show you how I turned it on for my particular device. And then there's also one from Microsoft that teaches you how to turn it on as well. So if that's a tool that for the devices that your students use, click on those links and do, um, do your self-directed learning there. Now in Word, there is um, speech to text now built in, which is amazing. You'll see it, you're gonna wanna make sure you're in the home ribbon, which is why home is underlined there in blue. And then you'll see at the far right side, there's the word dictate. You're just gonna click that and then you click it and off you go, you just start talking. Works really well. And then if you're in Google Docs, you want, they call it voice typing. So, you know, different vendors and different devices use different terminology. So um, within Google Docs, as opposed to text-to-speech where you find it in your add-ons, it's built into the tools tab. So you click on tools and you'll see about three quarters of the way down, there's the option for voice typing and there is a shortcut. So it's control shift S to turn it on, control shift S to turn it off if you are working in a Google doc. And there is a video, uh, a Loom video there linked in your handout to show you that again. Um, and another option to show you how to do speech to text in Google docs as well in your handout. Now, if you have an iPhone or an iPad, there is, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a link from LifeWire that shows you how to use speech to text on either your iPhone or your iPad. And if you have an Android device, then your uh, speech to text is the little microphone that the arrow is pointing to above the digits. You'll see there is another microphone next to the little smiley guy. That's different. So make sure you go to the microphone that's above the number three on your Android device. You just click that and then you can use your voice to dictate your text. Then there are some apps and Otter AI is a free app. Um, it's a great transcription uh, option. Um, and so it's completely free and you it is um, you just put it on your phone and then you put the phone near the speaker, press start, and it transcribes everything the speaker is saying. So you know if you are uh, for people that are hard of hearing or have a hearing impairment um, or you just want a record of a conversation, you can use the Otter AI app for speech to text transcription. And then there are three other links here for you to look into more transcribing voice text options, depending on what devices you have. Now we're going to roll into word prediction. So word prediction is when a child types a word or the user types a word, and then the word prediction detects what letters are being typed. And after a few letters, it makes suggestions for what words it thinks the user is trying to type. And those suggestions show up on the screen. So like you see here, I started to type the word, word. I actually wanted the word words, but it said, oh, do you want world, words, or work? And then all I had to do was click words and it populated that into what I was typing. So um, it works very well. There is also a link here from Understood Org, another wonderful resource from Jamie Martin that talks a lot about the basics, the ins and outs of word prediction. If you want to learn more about uh, word prediction, do a deeper dive there. Um, word prediction can be really helpful for our kids that struggle with the writing process and also our kids that struggle with spelling um, can be really helpful. Now, there is a limited amount of research. There are two studies that I like, this Silvio and Barbetta study, which is 2010, and then the last one here, Ev Menova, Graf, Jerome, and 
Berman, that's also a 2010 study, um, they talk about that students with specific learning disabilities tend to get lost in the weeds when it comes to writing. I think probably people in the audience can appreciate that. They tend to avoid or ignore the writing process, or they get over-focused on one aspect of the writing process, whether that's spelling or their penmanship or the vocabulary. They struggle to balance the organization of their thoughts and generating coherent written work. So word prediction alone, and this is a quote from the first study on page 25, and in combination with text-to-speech had a positive impact on the participants' writing. With variation, with word prediction alone, and with text-to-speech, participants in both cohorts wrote longer, more syntactically mature compositions that were better organized and had fewer spelling errors. So that's really promising. But again, the importance of direct instruction on how to use this with ample time to you know, kick the tires, if you will, before a looming deadline. Um, it's also really important to keep in mind that you want your students to have really good keyboarding skills intact because you can kind of mess with a, with a student's keyboarding skills if they are not fluid and automatic already with their keyboarding skills. Because some of these programs say, well, for the first word, click F1. For the second word, click F2. And that can really kind of mess with their typing skills. So keep that in mind. The second study has a quote that says from page 180, relative effectiveness of word prediction on various aspects of the writing process for some students with writing difficulties as compared to word processing alone, word prediction, regardless of the software, was effective in improving written spelling accuracy as measured by the proportion of words spelled correctly for all the participants in that particular study. So this is, again, encouraging research in the area of word prediction. So how do we turn it on? So there are different ways to do it. If you want to do word prediction on a PC, again, you're going to go to the search box at the bottom of your screen and enter in the word typing. And then it's going to come up with uh, the wording text suggestions. That's what word prediction is called on a PC, usually. And so you'll see it here on your screen on the bottom right-hand corner. Show text suggestions as I type toggle that on and that will populate the options for word prediction on the student's screen. If you have a newer MacBook, brand new, I would say in the last nine months to a year, the word prediction now is built into the toolbar above the keyboard where the digits are. So this is an image of my MacBook. You can see I was starting to type the word how and so it gave me three options, ho, how, and hopefully. And all you have to do is just reach up and click on or tap on that word and it will populate it for you. So that's on the newer MacBook. And there is a video in your, uh, in your handout if you have an older MacBook, how to do that. Um, and then if you have word prediction uh, for your iPad or your iPhone, you'll see that right above where the, the top of the keyboard I've got a thumbs up, the word poor or okay. It's again, built into the operating system on your iPhone and your iPad, and it will predict what they think your response should be based on what the text that came in on your phone was. So this person said, hello, how can I help you? And for whatever reason, it decided that these are my three possible options to respond. So again, is it perfect? No, but is it perhaps something that at least Facilitates the process, yes. Um, there is a link from Apple on how to use predictive text um, in your handout. Uh, if you do do it on an iPad, to turn it on, you want to go to the um, settings, go to general, then to keyboards, scroll down to predictive and toggle it on. That is how you access it within your iPad and your iPhone. If you have a Samsung device, uh, it is above, you can see now above where you would type your text. So it's a little different than an iPhone, but you'll see they, um, you know, how, how's the PowerPoint coming? It's going. And then the, the actually the Android has a, does a better job of predicting what the response should be. They say, yay, good, or that's great. So that's what it looks like on, a, on an Android device. 
Now, within Google Docs, um, the best way to do word prediction is to add an extension called Helper Bird. Helper Bird is an add-on that you can get, you know, just add it on to your Google Docs. Um, it, it, you can see it here on the screen. This is what it looks like. Um, Helper Bird has a lot of options to it, but it does include word prediction. So you'll see right there in the middle of the screen, it says word prediction, and it will ask you, it says, suggest a word. And in what I, what I was doing, it suggested that my next word would be either you or your. So this is the best option I have found within Google Docs is to add the Helper Bird option to your Google, Google Docs toolbar. Then there are some commercial products. I alluded to this. There is Co-Writer uh, by Don Johnston. We've already talked about Read and Write by Text Help. Again, reminder, these two companies have merged. So these products may end up changing at some point. It's too soon to tell. But Co-Writer has some specific dictionaries you can access. So if you're writing about dinosaurs, it can have a dedicated dictionary to that topic. You can use it with a student. Um, when you use it with a student, it does have a bit of a learning curve, so you have to really allow for that learning curve when you introduce co-writer to students, but once they get it, they get it, and it is a really great tool to facilitate the writing process. Um, and then, we, like I said, read and write is a great tool for this text-to-speech. And it's also a great tool for the word prediction. Um, it, these Both of these companies are fantastic. It's very exciting that they have merged. Um, and I look forward to seeing, you know, kind of their new products as they as they come, uh, uh, you know, uh, come to figure out what this merger is going to look like for them. Now, there are a couple other commercial products. One is Immersive Reader. That is a Microsoft 365 product. It is completely free. It is built into now. Uh, Immersive Reader is built in now to PowerPoint. It's built into OneNote. It's built into Microsoft Word, all the Microsoft products. Um, it really is fantastic. It is completely free. It is completely robust. Um, if we were in person, I would show this to you. Um, but check out Immersive Reader. It does a really nice job. Um, then there's Got It. Got It comes from a, a man in Israel. Who, him, who he himself is quite profoundly dyslexic. So he designed this because he was so frustrated when he would try to write and use any kind of spell checking technology and his spelling was so poor that nothing came close. And so he created his own program. And I will tell you, it is a fantastic tool. It is definitely not free. A universal license is 199 free, uh, per year per kid. It does offer a 30-day free trial, so definitely try that. The Chrome extension is 129, so it's not horrible. Um, but again, try before you buy. Um, I highly suggest you check out their videos that are linked in the handout so you can learn more about Got It. But I, I really love Got It. I think it's a, a fantastic tool. Now, here are some assessment tools to kind of help you narrow it down when you're trying to figure out the right tool for the right kid. So this is the UPAR. This is published by um, Don Johnston. This screenshot comes to you from a colleague of mine, uh, Sharon Plant, who graciously shared this with me. So this is a result of her data that she collected with a student using the UPAR. And what this does is that it compares the student's information when it's listening to uh, a book with a human voice versus a text reader, which is the computerized voice, and how that impacts their comprehension, and then also compares it to when the student just reads it silently and independently. So you can see here, when the kid read a passage independently on his, on his own, he was in the 20th, right bottom, bottom quartile, 20th percentile at the fourth grade level. But look at how he did at the sixth grade level with a human read voice, 92% accuracy, but with a computerized voice, he got 100% accuracy. But then as he went through the different passages, it turned out that you know he was reading and comprehending at the 12th grade level with 75% accuracy with a human read voice. So this is really great data to share with your team and share with the everybody who's working with your students, because um, it really helps you narrow down which tools you should begin to think about using with your students. And then there is the DeCoste Writing Protocol. Let me say that again, DeCoste Writing Protocol. Um, this is an in informal diagnostic tool for dysgraphia and other writing challenges. 
It is an informal diagnostic tool that helps educators identify factors affecting an individual student's ability to produce writing. The writing protocol compares a child's individual performance across handwriting and keyboarding tasks. It examines spelling performance and writing skills so educators can make more informed decisions about instructional strategies and the appropriate use of technology to meet the classroom demands. It also measures the efficacy of text-to-speech and word prediction, which can be helpful when you're trying to figure out which tools to try with your kids. The cost is $99 for one person. They actually updated their uh, protocol during COVID, so this can now be given remotely, um, which is nice. So if you are, you know, an AT specialist and you're, 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 you're now, you know, Zooming with kids, even though you can be in person because you you can actually, you know, reach more kids if you can be remote, um, you can give this remotely as well as in person. So thank you so much for listening and keep <laughs> tolerating this laryngitis as I fight this cold. Um, again, this is how you reach me. This is my email, my Twitter handle, and Wilson's Twitter handle. Um, you might have questions, so please don't be shy. I sincerely mean it when I offer my email address. I will get back to you. Uh, thank you again to LDA New Jersey branch for including me. I'm sorry I couldn't be there live, but when they changed the date, it just was not an option for me to be with you live uh, on May 20th. So I hope the rest of your conference is fantastic and have a great day.